Hello and welcome to this special webinar of the Opus Legacy Roundtable series, where we feature conversations with iconic thought leaders and business trailblazers, brought to you in partnership with Standard Chartered Bank and Opus by Prudential, a dedicated high net worth offering designed to meet your wealth management and legacy planning needs. I'm Melissa here. Now, each conversation in the Opus Legacy Roundtable series explores various aspects of crafting a legacy and the motivations and inspirations behind it. In this evening's conversation, we'll explore the idea of longevity, something that's both appealing and daunting. Now, it's appealing because the will to live is a natural instinct for humans or any sentient being for that matter. It's also daunting because longevity also means being old and having all the problems that come with age aging. But apparently, longevity need not equate aging. Is there a difference? And if there is, what is it? And what does it mean for us, our family and society? Well, this topic is becoming increasingly important because we're all living together or we're all living longer than ever before. Now, in Singapore, we have one of the highest life expectancy rates in the world at nearly 84 years, and this number is continuing to rise. But increasing lifespans come with challenges. Now, Prudential's latest research, Reimagining 100, shows that more than two in three Singaporeans are not prepared for their rising longevity from a health and wealth perspective. To learn more about how we can truly make the most of our longer lives, we'll be joined by global expert on longevity and the ageing society, Professor Andrew J. Scott, dialing in from the UK. Now, Andrew is Professor of Economics at London Business School. He has previously held posts at Harvard University, London School of Economics and Oxford University, among several other appointments. He is also a best-selling author. His book, The 100-Year Life, is a number one bestseller in Japan. His latest book is The New Long Life. Now, the Financial Times calls it a manifesto for better later years. That is essential reading for policymakers and chief executives. Now, for the first part of tonight's conversation, Andrew will spend some time sharing his perspective on longevity and how we can start crafting a future full of possibilities for ourselves and our loved ones. And for the second part, we'll go deeper into this topic with Andrew, where you will also have the opportunity to ask him your questions before we conclude. Well, Andrew, thank you for being with us today. Now, as you begin your talk, Andrew, perhaps um, a quick question to set it off. Now, from what I could tell, you began really, really focused on longevity and aging society only in the last, what, 10 to 15 years. So what was the catalyst for you to dive deeper into this topic? Yeah, great question, Melissa. So I guess there's two parts. One is professional and the other is personal. The professional is I've always liked ideas that have an impact and impact doesn't come bigger for me than longevity. Um, but also on a personal level, and by the way, as a trend, I think people have misunderstood it. So it's great to talk about something really important that touches each of us where everyone else doesn't really get it right. But also there was a personal side, which is I was a little bit bored doing what I'd always done, talking about interest rates and exchange rates. I wanted to do something different. And of course, that's one of the features of a long life, how we actually progress and change our identity from one thing to another. It was also something else, which was I had three children. And in particular, my uh, middle child, Louis, was just graduating. And he said, Dad, I'm not going to get a job. I'm going to take a couple of years out. And I was sort of quite angry about that, actually. I, I was worried and I was angry. But the more I thought about things and thought about why he was behaving differently from my generation and the parents' generation, the more it got me thinking about longevity and how we use the extra time that these longer lives bring. So a mixture of the personal and the professional. So what I want to try and do is uh, talk, get you to understand what longevity is and give you a different perspective on what is often called an aging society. So that's really what I'm about. And let me just begin though with the aging society because this is the, the dominant narrative. And obviously Singapore is an extraordinary example. A around the world, every country is seeing two things. A fall in the birth rate, uh, I think it's like 1.3 children now per female in Singapore, and more people living longer. And you combine those two things together, you have smaller, younger cohorts, and you have larger, older cohorts. So there's more older people. 
and the average age of society is increasing. And this is happening everywhere around the world. Uh, what marks out Singapore is how quickly these trends have happened and how dramatic they are. But around the world, we're seeing a rising proportion of older people. And that's what this slide shows you here globally. You know, the fastest growing age group in the world is people aged over 100. But everywhere, we're seeing more people aged over 65, more people aged over 85. And this is called an aging society. And not always very positively. You know, the notion is that old people are a problem. They don't work, they get ill, they need a pension, they're in poor health. Uh, I think that's a rather negative way of looking at it. I think we should be celebrating uh, mourning fewer children, losing fewer parents in midlife, and more grandparents meeting their grandchildren. Now, as I mentioned, with the day going from 24 to 32 hours, this is really about time. So let's do a following thought experiment. Let's ignore the first 20 years of life. Let's ignore the last 10 years of life. I'll give you an evenings to rest. I'll give you the weekends, but everything else I'm going to call productive hours. Time you could spend doing something. Well, if you live to 70, you have 125,000 hours. If you live to 100, you have 220,000 productive hours. You have another 100,000 productive hours. And that basically is the exam question that we're all being asked. What do you want to do with that extra 100,000 hours? It's not about end of life, it's about all of life. How do you spend that extra 100,000 hours? Do you just spend more time doing the same thing? Or do you look to do new challenges, new develop new skills and take on new identities? Because key to a long life is having a sense of purpose and a sense of engagement. But we will have to work for longer if we're living for longer. In the 100 Year Life book, uh, Melissa mentioned earlier, we say, well, actually, how do I think about responding to this extra time? How do I construct my life? And I want you to think about two groups of assets. So on the left-hand side, there's your financial assets. As an economist, and you know, I think about money, and a longer life requires me to save more because I'm probably going to be living longer and I need more resources. And that's why we have to work longer. So there's the financial assets. But it would be a terrible mistake just to focus on those. Because we've also got to focus on our intangible assets. Let me just come back to the financial assets. You know, I do some calculations and if you're going to be living to 100, you probably got to work until you're 80. But have a look at that intangible assets. And there's three key types of intangible assets. The first is your skills and knowledge. You've got to keep investing in those. So you can't rely upon working in your 70s on what you learned in your 20s. Lifelong learning is key. Then there's your vitality assets. That's your mental and physical health, as well as your friends and relationships. You've got to be investing in those all the time. And again, if you just work for 60 years, what's that going to do to your mental and physical health? What does that do for your relationships? You've got to be investing in these all the way through your life. Then there's something we call your transformational assets, which is your ability to deal with change. Change that either you choose or is forced upon you. I want to change my career. I've got to change my career because technology is taking me away. And in a longer life, you're going to have to be better at dealing with these transitions. And in the 20th century, we created a three-stage life, education, work, retirement. And what we're sort of doing is just stretching out that second stage, making people work for longer by pushing out the retirement day. But have a look at that intangible assets. And there's three key types of intangible assets. The first is your skills and knowledge. You've got to keep investing in those. So you can't rely upon working in your 70s on what you learned in your 20s. Lifelong learning is key. Then there's your vitality assets. That's your mental and physical health, as well as your friends and relationships. You've got to be investing in those all the time. And again, if you just work for 60 years, what's that going to do to your mental and physical health? What does that do for your relationships? You've got to be investing in these all the way through your life. Then there's something we call your transformational assets, which is your ability to deal with change. Change that either you choose or is forced upon you. I want to change my career. I've got to change my career because technology is taking me away. And in a longer life, you're going to have to be better at dealing with these transitions. 
If you put all these things together, what you realize is that we can't respond to longer lives just by stretching out that three-stage life, just by working longer and retiring later. Instead, we see a multi-stage life begin to emerge. A multi-stage life is one of many careers and different changes and transitions. Sometimes working very hard, focused on money, other times recharging, a better work-life balance, giving you the scope to work on your health or your relationships, or perhaps doing something with the community and being something more social entrepreneur. So that three-stage life of education, work and retirement is beginning to break out, break up. This is a big mindset change for parents. I talked about my own son earlier on because we're so keen on our children to be successful. We force feed them into this three stage life. But for all of us, whether you're 20, 50 or 80, this multi stage life is emerging. If you're in your mid 40s and you're going to be working to your mid 70s, you've got more work ahead of you than you've done already. That's a real sort of big change that comes then with longevity. What do I want to do? How do I prepare myself? Am I bored with what I do? What is the thing that really excites me? How do I make sure that I influence how we age? We mustn't focus on chronological age. That's sort of how many candles there are on my birthday cake. You've got to focus I would say, on two other things. One is biological age. What is my health? And make sure that you're as healthy as possible for as long as possible. Some very interesting developments happening in that space. But also what I call prospective age. Because really what matters is not the number of candles in your cake, but how many more cakes you're going to have. And at every age, you can now expect more birthday cakes. In the 20th century, we invented life insurance. So that was a world where, because many people died in middle age, you had life insurance. And you made sure that your family was protected financially if you died in middle age. Now there's something else around. We have to have longevity insurance because the really big challenge we face with these longer lives is outliving our wealth, outliving our health, outliving our skills, outliving our sense of purpose and outliving our sense of relationships. We have to keep investing not just in our finances, in our skills, our health, our relationships. In this long life, you want to be healthy and always have a sense of purpose. The new imperative is to age well. If for the first time ever the young will become the old, the new health imperative is to age well. I heard a lot of talk about the silver economy, looking after older people. It's very important, but even more important is what I call the evergreen economy, making sure we age well. Will all of us be prepared to spend money to be looked after when we're old, but we'll spend even more money making sure we age well? Education, pharmaceuticals, food and drink, exercise, leisure. This is the evergreen economy that's going to start to die. Prudential actually had done uh, some research. Uh, the latest that I see is something called Reimagining 100 um, on Singaporeans um, that I understand you contributed your expert take to as well. Uh, it discusses the impact of the pandemic on our well-being and longevity. So Andrew, maybe let me first catch everyone up on some of the key findings before I get your view on, on them. Now the study found right, that on financial well-being, nearly half of those surveyed say it has worsened since the pandemic began. That's on financial well-being. Now, on mental health, more than a third feel that the state of their mental health has become worse in the past year. Now, for about one in four people, they say that their physical health has deteriorated as well. <laughs> Now, in view of the worsening financial and work-related stress caused by the pandemic, it's perhaps unsurprising that the quality of relationships has also been affected. Prudential's 2018 survey had 9 in 10 people saying they were happy in their most significant relationships. But fast forward to Prudential's latest research, that number has dropped by about 30 percentage points from 92% uh, to 62%. That's 6 in 10 people compared with 9 in 10 people before who say they're happy with their relationships. So, Andrew, as we contemplate the issue of longevity, what are the implications of these pandemic findings? It's so interesting and what a fascinating set of statistics, particularly the one about the relationships. Um, so let, let me just say a few things about when the pandemic first started to, to sort of happen back February, March in 2020. Here am I, an economist focusing on longevity and there's a global pandemic happening. And I worried for my own health, my family and the world. But I also thought, well, no one is going to be interested in longevity in the midst of a pandemic. 
What is extraordinary is how the interest in this topic has just increased. And in particular, the need to focus on our health has really come to the forefront. The awareness of how many old people we've got who have been particularly vulnerable has been key, but also the recognition that our health is not just physical, it's also mental. And you know, those statistics you gave obviously paint a disturbing picture of a quite extraordinary time. But it has almost, I would say, helped more and more people think, well, what matters? Now, it's also thrown up new opportunities. We keep talking about a different work-life balance. Um, but, you know, I think more and more people have recognized that, you know, a sense of place and a sense of relationships are utterly key. And for a lot of us, that was what we got from work, but denied the ability to go into work, then they thrown a spotlight on what was happening locally. So our community and our homes, and of course, they are the most important relationships. You know, I talked about those different assets, about how you make the most of a long life and how you can think of those assets as redesigning how we live our life. The thing that comes through time and time again on studies of what makes for a good life is its relationships. It's creating the space to love and to be loved. So, of course, those, those findings you've got there around mental health and stress and the pressure it put on relationships says, wow, how do we rebuild that? And I think that's what's really important about longevity and I would say technology, which in the new long life we bring together AI and robotics and longevity. We've got to make sure that we focus on the human with technology. We've got to make sure that we enable us as humans to do the things that we're good at. And that's about actually connecting with one another. It's about empathy. And the danger of a hundred year life is we focus so much on building up the financial assets that the finances run our life. But really we want the finances to support the life that we need. And so what is it that we need? Human connection, human connectivity, and a sense of community. And those things are gonna become ever more important. And I think that's what COVID has revealed so, so very strongly. So we've got to think about investing in a wide portfolio of assets. Yes, you need to invest in your finances. Yes, you need to invest in skills and purpose, but also health, mental health, and relationships. I, th I think it should, it's, it's really interesting that you should um, highlight, especially, um, you know, the importance of the non-financial aspect. I mean, financial is definitely very important, and we will get into that um, afterwards. I really want to have time to talk about that. Um, but when we're talking about the non-financial aspect, like physical and psychological health, um, there was a study that I found um, between Singapore's Ministry of Health and the Global Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation that found that Singaporeans may be living longer, but are also spending more time in ill health up to 10 and a half years, right? And when it comes to nurturing psychological health, a prudential study found that Singaporeans also tend to put all their eggs into one basket, their family, right? So would you say that investing in non-financial matters might actually be the most common oversight that people tend to make when it comes to uh, living longer generally? You know, ageism is a very strange thing because, you know, sexism, I, I'm probably not going to change my gender. Ethnicity, I'm not going to change my ethnicity. But every person who's young is probably going to become old. So ageism is a really sort of a, is a prejudice against your future self. So yes, we absolutely have to tackle ageism. And where actually you realize it's not really age that is the issue. People of all ages are just people. So that's the kind of the, the way in which you, I think, deconstruct this narrative. But it's certainly hard. But as I say, the key thing, I think, is you can start with your own actions and not try and infer anything from someone's chronological age as to what they need or what they can do. I think that's very, very limiting. Now, um, financial planning, we did say we want to talk about that, is definitely a critical cornerstone in preparing for longer life expectancies. Um, again, I would like to cite a Prudential's uh, findings in that. They have done really quite a lot of work on this. Uh, more than two in three Singaporeans are not prepared financially for their rising longevity. Um, where do you see are the common mistakes or the kind of misconceptions people tend to have when it comes to planning financially for the future? So, you know, I, I, there's, there's so many issues here. So, so one would be simply that we're just not very good at planning for the future. There's a present bias in so many of our actions. And actually, as life expectancy gets longer, that's a real challenge because we need to learn a new skill. How do I plan for my future self? 
But our survival evolutionary is very, very much about meeting present needs. But when the first time ever the young will become the old, we have to try and learn patience, long-term perspective. And, and this is something we can learn, but it has to be taught. So teaching financial literacy, teaching health literacy, all of these things are important. So, so one problem is we're just not very good at planning for the future. Um, another problem I have is most people just aren't aware of these life expectancy trends. And there's a bunch of reasons behind that, including the fact that most governments, when they produce their headline number of life expectancy, it's a very static view of life expectancy. Uh, it doesn't involve any projections on these life expectancy trends. So most people are just unaware of how long they're likely to live for. So that's two very, very real problems. So how do you overcome that? Well, I think, you know, there's there's a couple of things that are key. I talked about financial literacy, but we do need to try and get people to save more. And that's really hard because most people have very pressing financial needs today. But I think this is where these auto enrollment schemes are so important. And of course, Singapore had the Central Provident Fund. But making sure that you try and help people, you know, even if it's a small amount of money, particularly when they're young, have that money gets locked away for a long term purpose is really key. But then the other thing I want to try and sort of say is I find it interesting as an economist because I will straight away go to think about money. And I'm comfortable with numbers, I'm comfortable with compound interest. But most people aren't. And I think one of the problems with the financial sector is it often tries to tell people, you must save more money, you must manage your funds differently. But that's not actually what people buy into. I think what's interesting to me, focusing on time and longevity, is most people are comfortable budgeting with time. Every day, I haven't got enough time. How do I use this time here and there? And if you point out that actually there is this longer life, people start thinking, well, how do I structure that time? And that's when they then start coming into the finances. And for me, that's sort of way to try and get into financial planning. Finances are key, but the finances support the life that we want to have. And if we can think about the life we want to have, we can then infer a financial plan. And I think for me, that's the really big change that is happening with finances. You do need to save more in a longer life. You do need to plan your finances differently. But there's sort of a convergence occurring with wealth and health, and I think purpose as well. So, you know, you cannot possibly think about your future finances without saying, will I have the health to be able to earn money if I need to? And will I have the skills necessary to earn money as well? So the savings for the future isn't just financial, it's also your health and your skills. And of course, that's important too, because if you haven't got the health later on, you won't be able to spend the money in the way that you want to. So I think the really big trend is this integration of, finan of financial health and physical and mental health and purpose and well-being. Uh, and that, that is what I call that longevity insurance. How do I insure myself against living too long? Uh, and that, that's about finances, health, skills, relationships and purpose. Money is a way of giving yourself future options and you have more future. So taking care of the finances is absolutely key. But then there's your health. And you know the thing I think that is really important for all of us to understand is to focus on age. Age is backward looking. It's about how many years you've had. It's also forward looking how many more years to go. And what can you give your future self? Making a best friend of your future self is really, really important. So giving your future self money, giving yourself health, giving yourself relationships and a sense of purpose. Well, I hope tonight's conversation has given you some inspiration and direction on how you can better prepare for living a longer life and building a more valuable legacy. If you'd like to discuss your wealth and legacy planning needs, please get in touch with your relationship manager. And for more details on Opus by Prudential, go to opus.prudential.com.sg. I'm Melissa Hyak. Thank you for joining this conversation brought to you by Standard Chartered Bank and Opus by Prudential. Good night.